Hi, and welcome to the first lecture. Uh, so we're just going to jump on in. I do want to remind you that as you watch this, you should be taking notes because this will come in handy when you take uh, in-class quizzes. And um, okay, here we go. So welcome to chapter 1.1. We're going to be talking about um, line shape and the principle of contrast. So before we get into these specific words, I want to talk in general about um, some concepts here called the elements and principles of art. Uh, because really these first 10 chapters, the first two or so weeks of this course, uh, we're going to be focusing on uh, on these concepts. So what are they? What are the elements of art? What are the principles of art? Well, the elements of art, you need to think of them as kind of the basic vocabulary of art. So in the same way that uh, our languages are made up of, of words, of nouns and verbs, and pronouns, adjectives, adverbs, those kinds of things, uh, if you think about all images are created from the same stuff. They're made of line, shape, form, mass, volume, color, texture, space, time and motion, and value. All images utilize some or all of these, depending on how simple or complex. So whether you're looking at the Nike swoosh or the Mona Lisa, you're going to see line and shape and color, right? Um, the principles are how those are arranged. So um, let me adjust my little picture down here. Um, the principles of art, think of this as sort of the rules of grammar. Um, so these are things like contrast and balance, unity, variety, rhythm, emphasis, pattern, proportion, and scale. And we're not going to be studying all of these today, but I just want to give you an idea of what's to come in the future and, and uh, what to look forward to. Um, so today we're going to be talking about some of the most basic uh, uh, elements of art. And we're going to start with line. Um, you know, line is present in most images. Um, you know, at its very simplest, line is the connection between two points. You probably remember that from uh, high school math. But a uh, line can do some other things. Line can define the boundaries between planes. Uh, it can define shapes. It can also direct our eye to where the artist or designer wants us to look. And it can convey a sense of movement and energy. It can do a lot of things, actually, line can. Um, so... You know, one of the most basic kinds of line is something we call a contour line. What you're looking at is an example of a contour line here, which is basically the outline um, of, of a shape um, is a contour line. So these are the f famous Nazca lines. These come from Peru, and these are large images that are hundreds of feet long that were uh, more or less sort of scraped into the surface of the desert in Peru uh, as part of a religious ceremony. And these were images made to be seen by the gods. These images um, can't really be seen from ground level, but they can be seen from uh, above. They're rather cool. And most of them are images of animals, like this giant spider that you see here. But these are other examples of contour lines. A contour is the outer edge or profile of an object. It's not necessarily the complete outline. So, you know, a contour line, a contour line can describe sort of just a small area. It doesn't necessarily have to be the complete outline, as we can see in this work by um, the artist Henri Matisse or over here by the work by Pablo Picasso. Um, it's not necessarily going to, uh, there can be breaks in it. It's not going to be the entire outline. Um, but it is uh, sort of the outer edge or profile of a form. And contour line can also exist in color images too, uh, as we can see in the black outlines here around the various shapes in this painting also by Pablo Picasso. So that's real simple basic stuff. Sometimes lines though are uh, not actually there, but they are implied. So on the left we have actual lines, right? It, it connects point A to point B, whether it's a straight line or a curving line, a thick line or a thin line or a smooth line or a sort of uh, nervous looking kind of line. It, it's all uh, connecting one point to another, but implied lines are 
well, you guessed it, implied. Uh, they they rely on our minds to fill in the gaps in between spaces. So a dotted line is a perfect example, or a dashed line, or perfect examples of of implied lines, right? Uh, this is a really cool example. Uh, this comes from um, a, a Jewish uh, holy book, the Pentateuch, uh, which is basically the five um, uh, first books of, of the Old Testament. Uh, that's what uh, the Pentateuch is. And uh, um, these are really, really cool. These are uh, you know, designed for the rabbi at the temple to read, uh, but uh, you'll notice that there's these borders around the words here, and this is written in Hebrew. Uh, but if you look at the borders up close and zoom in, you see something that is called a masora. Uh, but this is a text line um, made up uh, to create a contour or an implied line, I should say. I got I see I'm still on contour line. Uh, made an implied line. Um, th these are basically, think of this as sort of like footnotes for the text, right? This helps the rabbi understand the deeper meaning of the, of the, of the text. Uh, but instead of just sort of written at the bottom of the page, it creates this really cool design. I think all academic books should, uh, instead of having footnotes, should do something like this, have like really cool designs and patterns um, made of it. That would be very difficult to do. But a guy can dream, can he? Okay, moving on. Um, here's another example of implied line. This is a, a painting by uh, the French Rococo artist, a guy named Jean-Antoine Watteau, and uh, this, in his um, embarkation of, to Cythera, we see this row of people um, forming a line. But of course, most of these people aren't touching. It's not an actual line. It's an implied line. I think you guys get the implications of implied lines. You're welcome. All right, directional lines. The lines can communicate direction and movement. Directional lines focus our attention on different sections. So uh, strong diagonal lines can add an intense feeling of movement. For example, in this um, uh, manga image here, and manga is um, the Japanese word for comic, in this manga image here we get the idea that this guy is plunging downwards through space, right? Because of these directional lines uh, guiding us, uh, guiding our eye and showing us the direction of his movement. So directional lines, you see this a lot in cartoons and comics um, to sort of imply movement and show us where he's moving. Um, also, directional lines can be used to direct our eye, the viewer. Uh, our eye when we look at something. So um, in this work here by uh, Francisco de Goya, uh, there's actually two sets of directional lines. Uh, there's a series of lines sort of formed by uh, the, the hillside here and the row of soldiers up through the people to guide our eye uh, to make us uh, sort of l look through the painting, but also, and I think m a much more um, forcefully, uh, the, the arms of the central figure here at the firing squad it, it forms two lines that draw our eye in. And this is really important, guys, because uh, this is a concept we're going to be talking about more and more and more as we get through but, uh, uh, these chapters. But artists, a good artist, will sort of direct you where to look. And oftentimes when you look at a work of art, your eye will go to a certain place first or it will look in objects in a certain order because the artist has arranged them in a way, um, in a line, if you will, to direct our eye. And it's completely unconscious of us. You know, if these arrows weren't here, um, you would still probably look at this guy first in the center because his arms are directing you directly towards him and you don't even realize it. Good artists, good designers, good architects, good any sort of visual artist um, will often make us see what they want us to see without us even realizing it. Uh, compositional lines form the structure or composition of a work of art. Think of compositional lines as um, 
sort of like the two by fours in your walls, right? If you um, were to go to your wall and bust a hole in it, don't do that, the landlord won't like it. But if you were to bust a hole in your wall, you would see a series of vertical two by fours. That forms the structure of your home or your apartment or wherever you're, you live, right? And we can think of, of works of art and kind of being structured the same way by line. Line creates the composition. For example, in this work by Thomas Aikens of these two brothers, the Belgian brothers, racing, um, we see a series of lines, mostly horizontal lines, forming the structure of this work, right? And, and the whole work is sort of built on these stacked kind of horizontal lines. And even some of these aren't even marked, but we got like these guys here too. Uh, um, and all the ripples in the water also. Uh, so it's almost like a layered cake, but you can literally see the structure of the work of art. Now, sometimes those structures can be chaotic, right? Um, like in the image on the left, instead of this, these structured horizontal lines, we instead see this kind of hodgepodge of a bunch of different lines of, of, of horizontals and, and verticals, but also curving lines, or the fancy artsy term we can use is curvilinear, curvilinear lines, or um, uh, zigzag lines, or diagonal lines, all sorts of different lines. And also, what's interesting about these compositional lines, the way the artist structured lines, it can also create a, a different feeling. For example, the image on the right, even though these are two brothers racing um, through, <laughs> you know, on a river, it's a rather kind of boring image, I would say. Uh, not necessarily bad, but I wouldn't say it's an exciting image because it's mostly horizontals. And horizontal lines are, well, they sort of imply rest, don't they? You know, when you think about sleeping and you're horizontal. And so it's not as exciting as I think visually as the image on the left, which gives us a lot of different variety of lines that do a lot of interesting things. They crisscross each other and all that stuff. But also, now think about this though. The image on the right, in terms of its subject matter, two guys in a boat rowing really fast, should be more exciting than the image on your left, which is a bunch of old ladies carrying bread around uh, down some stairs. That shouldn't be that, uh, th the image on the left should not be a more exciting image, if you just think about it in terms of the subject. But the way the artist has composed the image, and the way the artist has used these exciting sort of crisscrossing lines, at least personally, and you know, we all have our own opinions, and, and uh, you know, your mileage may vary on these things, but um, the image on the left, at least to me, is a lot more of an interesting image than the image on the right even though the image on the right should be more exciting. Now this is an image that is a perfect example of a work of art that is both um, exciting in terms of its story and in terms of the use of li its line. And I'm going to be talking a while about this, so I really hope you're taking notes. And since this is on YouTube, if you want to look at the, um, the transcript of this, uh, you, you can, um, if you want to look at the captions, you can and, and cut and paste those. Um, but so, okay, so here we go. So compositional, so, I um, got ahead of myself. So this is a, a, a work called The Raft of the Medusa. It's by an artist named Theodore Jericho, who was uh, a French artist. And this is a work of art that, first of all, I want you to notice the size here. If we look over here, you'll notice that it is 16 by 24 feet. This thing is massive. This hangs in the Louvre Museum, and it is, it is, uh, in my opinion, one of the great works of art, and it is absolutely awe-inspiring to see in real life. I mean, it's the size of a movie screen. It's, it's absolutely huge. Um, so, you know, oftentimes, you know, you're watching this on your computer or your phone or your tablet, and you're seeing it in a very tiny, <laughs> Uh, tiny sort of image, and that of course is not the way Jericho would have wanted this, or or even thought that this could be seen this way, right? Uh, this was this is meant to be this awe-inspiring, massive image. So let's talk about it. Let's talk about the story here. This is the story um, of a ship called uh, the Medusa. The Medusa is a French naval vessel that is 
uh, on a, a diplomatic mission to Senegal in West Africa. And on its way there, the ship hits a sandbar and crashes. Now, the reason it crashed is because the captain of the ship was incompetent uh, and should not probably have been captain. Uh, but he was made captain, he was given this commission because he came from a wealthy and powerful French aristocratic family. In fact, this was not uncommon practice to give um, these commissions to naval, uh, these naval commissions to officers who were unqualified because of the families they came from. And his incompetence led to tragedy. The ship hits this sandbar and this, uh, oh, the, this, this ship crashes and it wrecks. Um, and now the problem is there were about 400 people on board and 160 in the crew. But unfortunately the lifeboats, the lifeboats only held something around like 250 people. And so that means they left somewhere around 146 people behind. Now uh, initially the officers took the lifeboats for themselves. Um, Although, it, to be fair, some officers did try to rescue some members of the crew, but the captain ultimately said we should abandon them. And then the life, the, those lifeboats carrying mostly the officers uh, went and caught back up with the rest of the fleet, just basically abandoning uh, these 146, 150 men or whatever it was on the open ocean. And as soon as they were abandoned, uh, chaos ensued. These men started fighting with each other, uh, killing each other, some of them, and it, it was this uh, horrific sort of situation. And at the same time, the, uh, the crew basically made a large raft out of the remnants of the Medusa. Now, most people died, um, but over a period of about 13 days or, or so, the, um, a, a small amount of crew members did survive. Something like 15 survived uh, over this two-week period or so. And, and they survived uh, through horrific means. They had no fresh food, they had no uh, fresh water, and some of them even resorted to cannibalism to survive. Now, meanwhile, the, the ship carrying the captain had already arrived back in France and reported that there was a storm, we crashed into a sandbar, and we tried to rescue everybody, but the ship sank immediately, more or less, is what they reported. And, of course, that's untrue. The captain abandoned almost half of his crew. So, um, what happens is, almost two weeks later, the remnants of this crew are rescued. They're rescued by a passing ship, and if you look in the background, here you can see this little smudge. That little smudge is actually a ship called the Argus. And the Argus sees the Medusa and it sees the crew waving scraps of clothing or sails or whatever sort of fabric they had. And they rescue them. And they take these men back to France. And when these men arrive, when the crew of the Medusa arrived back in France, the remnants, the 15 or so who survived, they had a very different story to tell. They told of the captain abandoning them, abandoning them. They told of the captain's incompetence, right? And it was absolutely horrific uh, what they told, their story. And this caused a huge scandal. This thing dominated the headlines in the papers for weeks and weeks. And not only did it sort of show the incompetence of the captain, but it showed the um, sort of you know, the practices of the French Navy of giving these unqualified guys, basically sort of rich guys, <laughs> uh, uh, positions that they didn't deserve, and it cost people their lives. Um, so it was a huge, it was a huge deal. Um, Jericho, the artist, was fascinated by this story. In fact, he even rented in an apartment uh, across the street from the hospital where many of these men were recovering and he interviewed them and he sketched them and he uh, you know drew out their story and um, uh, ended up creating this massive uh, massive work. Um, one thing also I want to bring your attention here is the the figure up here. Um, this is a guy named Jean Charles and Jean Charles uh, was a freed slave and he was part of the crew here, and he, uh, um, and 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 he is portrayed as the hero. 
uh, this black man at a time uh, where a lot of European countries, including France, were still practicing slavery. But Jericho was an abolitionist, meaning he fought for the abolition of slavery. It was one of his uh, sort of passions, and he was very much part of this political cause. And he uh, sort of highlights uh, Jean Charles's role here as sort of the hero uh, as he's waving as he's waving his flag. So a very dramatic story. Oops, got it. Sorry. Uh, told in a very dramatic uh, way. Um, so um, if you look at the use of line, <laughs> we're going back to that line. Um, you'll notice that the artist has created several different kinds of lines. Um, He's using uh, the lines, of course, in the sail or the rope on the sail and the, the, the mast here and the side of the sail. But if you look at the figures themselves, they form a line. And if you look closely, that line almost kind of mirrors a wave, doesn't it? Um, and it causes a sense of drama. It also draws our eyes upwards towards this central figure here, John Charles. So uh, the artist is, is very much using a line to tell the drama of this story. I mean, imagine if he had painted this like the Bilgen brothers and it was all flat horizontal lines. It'd be boring. Uh, but this, to me, is a, a perfect example of how the artist is using an element, in this case line, to help tell the story. In, case, in this case, he's using very dramatic line to tell a very dramatic story. Pretty cool, right? Here's another example of an artist using line to help tell a story. This is a painting by the Mexican artist Frida Kahlo. This is an artist that many of you might be aware of. She's very, very famous and probably one of the most well-known artists of the 20th century. Um, she was an artist who was actually married to another very famous artist, the Mexican painter um, uh, Diego Rivera. Um, and uh, Frida's story is a fascinating one. Um, she uh, um, uh, grew up in a, in a very sort of traditional uh, kind of household, uh, and uh, she was uh, in a bus accident when she was very young, or well, she was a teenager. And this bus accident was horrific. It, um, basically, she was more or less impaled on a pole. Uh, it shattered her pelvis, her spine, it broke her legs. Um, it, it caused her problems for the rest of her life, um, pain and agony, and, and led to a rather short life for her. It also prevented her from having children, and she spent years and years in and out of hospitals with, you know, going through all sorts of different surgeries. It was a very horrific uh, event, but also foundational kind of to who she was as a person. Uh, because while she was recuperating in her bed, which took something like a year or so to do, her father bought her a set of paints to pass the time. And she, you know, this, she couldn't be on her phone because there were no phones. But so she, she started to paint. And that's how she sort of not only became an artist, but also as a way of kind of getting herself through this horrific time in her life. And Frida spent really the rest of her life as an artist painting self-portraits, mostly self-portraits. Most of her images, you can almost think of them as kind of diary entries. Um, and her life is very tragic. Her husband, Diego Rivera, often cheated on her. Um, there's rumors I think he cheated on her with her sister. I mean, it's pretty heavy-duty stuff. And at the same time, she suffered some miscarriages. Um, and her, her images are often filled with images of body parts, of anatomy, of surgery, of blood and guts, because, well, this was a big part of who she was. And her images sometimes can be a little disturbing to look at. Um, and this image is no exception. Um, we see uh, uh, an image of, 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 of an artery, uh, a bloodline really, connecting these two Fridas. And this is what I find fascinating about this image. I mean, this image is about the two different people that she feels that she is. Um, she's on, on the right, we see this woman in this modern dress. Uh, she was very much an internationally known sort of artist. She, you know, hung out with stars and politicians and sort of the big names of the world. She, you know, uh, hung out in New York and Paris and you know, 
the, the big sort of art centers of the world and was this very sort of, you know, there weren't jets yet, but she was this kind of jet setter, right? Um, at the same time, she still was very traditional in a lot of ways and drew very much from her Mexican heritage. And we see the image of this woman on the left in this very traditional uh, sort of Mexican dress. And you'll notice that they're, they both share a bloodline. You can't really have one without the other. And this is, this, in her sort of graphic, gory, sort of Frida Kahlo way, she's sort of talking about even though we change through our lives, and as you guys get older, you will change. You'll become a different person than you were when you were young. And yet, that person is still part of you because they formed who you are. We are just sort of a sum of all of the experiences, good and bad, that we've had, right? And even though we change over time, and our opinions change, and our beliefs change, and we become different people, I'm a very different person at 50 than I was when I was 15. And yet, that 15-year-old is still a part of me. He's connected. Just like Frida's past, her heritage, her family, her culture, her childhood is part of her. And if you sever one, if one is severed, is ignored, is removed, then the other one dies. And it's all told through line. Simple little red line conveys all of that information. So lines can do a lot, right? <laughs> Um, lines can uh, um, sort of express feelings and emotions. Um, so, you know, your book sort of breaks it down into this very simple way. Uh, vertical lines communicate strength and stability and authority. You know, think of like the columns on a building. Uh, or horizontal lines, like we saw in the, in the Brothers Racing, can communicate calm or peacefulness. Think of sleeping, right? Diagonal lines create movement and drama, right? You know, think of a, of a, you know, <laughs> a, a bird flying up through the air or whatever, you know. Diagonal lines in, in place sort of speed. And so look at these two images. These are both abstract images. They're just designs, right? They're not pictures of anything. They're just designs. But look at the image on the left. Um, the, these are, the, they, they sort of, imply control and logic and rationality. I mean, it's just lines, but since they are geometric and regular and, and uh, um, sort of uh, logical, they feel logical and controlling and regulatory. And yet the images on the, the lines on the right feel passionate, right? They're just lines. They're just, they're not even pictures of anything, but that feels crazy and exuberant and intense to me on the right. And the one on the left appears logical and rational. Just lines. Here's a very famous line you are probably familiar with. The good old Nike swoosh. And what does this line sort of imply to you? What does it, it make you feel? You're probably, yeah, 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 you're right. You're probably saying speed. Right? Like a comet or a lightning bolt, you know, um, a rocket. It feels fast, which is really appropriate for an athletic or a sporting, you know, a sporting good company, right? And Nike started specifically as a runner, a running company, a running shoe company. And uh, they wanted a, a logo that implied speed. And so they hired this, uh, uh, this designer, Carolyn Davidson, to create uh, a logo for them, which they paid her thirty-five dollars for. <laughs> that's that's insane, isn't it? Um, you know, a lot of designers like that work on commission, so you get paid only once to design a logo that might be used thousands and millions of times throughout over decades or even centuries, and yet you get paid one fee. Um, however, Nike actually did the right thing here. They gave Carolyn Davidson. Uh, a few years later, 500 shares of stock in Nike, which I don't know what the market value of Nike stock is, but I'm sure that was sufficient. Right? <laughs> she did good, right? Um, but here we are looking at one of the most famous and recognizable images in the world, and it's basically a line, right? 
Isn't that crazy? Like, when you see the Nike swoosh, you think of the great athletes of history, you know? I mean, you can't, I can't not think of, you know, Michael Jordan, for instance. And I think of speed and accomplishment and athletic ability and prowess and all this stuff. And it's just a friggin' line, guys. Pretty cool. Line can also uh, communicate sort of negative things. Like, look at the lines <coughs> in this painting by Vincent van Gogh. Vincent van Gogh was a man who often uh, uh, suffered from sort of mental difficulties, emotional problems. And look at the way he's painted the lines, especially in the floor of his bedroom here. There's, they feel nervous and unsure and intense. He was often an intense, sort of unsure, sometimes even angry man. And even though the colors of this bedroom look calm and peaceful with sort of blues and greens uh, dominating, uh, the line tells us another story. It shows us an intensity and maybe even a passion here. Shape. Shape is a two-dimensional area which is uh, the boundaries of which are defined by lines or suggested by changes in color or value. So um, a shape is another one of our basic foundational elements of art. And when, in the art world, we talk about two basic kinds of shapes. We talk about geometric and organic shapes. My cat is yelling at me. Here. This is Astrid. She will probably, you'll probably see her throughout these videos because she's very bossy. And she has a lot to say. Um, so geometric, um, uh, organic shapes are made up of unpredictable, irregular lines, like the shapes down here. They appear organic, or you know, sort of like they're grown almost. Uh, uh, geometric shapes are mathematically regular and precise. So squares, circles, rectangles, cones, you know, those kinds of things. Here's a great example of um, both regular um, our geometric and organic shapes sort of combined. In the background, we have the organic shapes of the, the squares or the diamonds, however you want to see them. Uh, and in the front, we have these images of flowers and clothes and things like that, which are very geometric in their design. I mean, very organic in their design. Got a little ahead of myself, guys. Just like there can be implied line, there's also implied shapes, like the images here on the right. You know, we have a, a, a pentagon um, uh, or a triangle, and of course the very famous AT&T logo, or the Death Star, I like to call it. Um, we have, uh, you know, the great designer Saul Bass uh, designed this very memorable logo that implies sort of the globe. You know, AT&T is a global communications company, but there's actually not a globe here. Actually, what we have just are a series of sort of weirdly shaped lines that give us the feeling uh, that imply. Just like we have compositional lines, we also have uh, a compositional shapes, Sh uh, shapes that form the structure of a work of art. So, for example, here is um, a, a painting by the uh, great Ninja Turtle and Renaissance artist Raphael called the Madonna of the Meadows. And this is a religious painting of uh, um, the Madonna. We'll talk more about her in a moment. Um, in uh, the form of basically a triangle, right? Uh, this is something you're going to see a lot in Renaissance art, especially. Uh, artists often sh put their figures in the, fa in the shape of a triangle because it's a good, strong shape, right? The, the three corners of the triangle kind of bring your eyes in. Triangle has a big sort of flat bottom. So, uh, isn't that a Queen song? Anyway, uh, it has a big sort of flat bottom that, uh, uh, it, you know, sort of brings your eye in, and it's a very strong shape. It's not going anywhere. It's very solid, um, and it looks awesome in a painting. Uh, and so the, the artist has arranged the three figures here in this form of the triangle. And this is something you'll start to see a lot. Like, think of the Mona Lisa. Think of like the way I'm sitting right now. I'm in a triangle. You see that a lot in Renaissance art. But if you think about it, it's actually kind of weird. I mean, how many times have you, ever walked, have you ever walked into a room and seen three people standing around forming a triangle? It never happens. But 
what often would look weird in reality, I mean, it would look really goofy if three people stood in the form of a triangle. What, what looks weird in reality often looks great in a two-dimensional image. I mean, think about, um, you know, models. You know, you've seen shows like America's Next Top Model, and, you know, when the way the photographer has those models stand is completely, you know, ridiculous. You know, they, they're all, like, hunched up and, like, twisting and turning and stuff, and it looks ridiculous in real life. If you walked into a room and saw a, a person standing there like like that, you'd be like, what the hell is wrong with that person? But it looks awesome in a magazine or on Instagram or whatever it is uh, because the rules of two-dimensional art and the rules of three-dimensional dimensional reality are different rules, right? And so there you go. Also, Another reason why the triangle is used is because of the subject matter. This is an image of a figure called the Madonna. Madonna is another word for the Virgin, another name for the Virgin Mary. In Italian, it means my lady. In fact, another common term you will hear is Notre Dame or Notre Dame in French, um, which means our lady. And these are what we call honorifics. They're titles. But uh, this is a uh, the Madonna, uh, so this is the Virgin Mary, and then so that would mean this is the Christ Child, and then the the little guy kneeling here is John the Baptist. So you know this they also have halos. So John the Baptist, Christ Child. Um, you'll also notice that she's wearing red and blue. These are very common colors you will find the Virgin Mary wearing. She she often wears a combination of these. Sometimes it will be more blue. Um, sometimes exclusively blue, but usually, especially in European um, Italian Renaissance art, it will be red and blue. Um, those are her colors. Um, this is something called iconography. Iconography are the symbols that uh, are used to represent a concept or a person, right? Uh, we'll talk more about this later on. Um, but oftentimes color is used as the iconography of a figure, so you instantly recognize. Think about superheroes, right? Um, you know, red, blue, and black is Spider-Man, right? Um, so red and blue on a young lady in a Renaissance painting, you can almost guarantee that's going to be the Madonna. Contrast is the juxtaposition of two noticeably different states of an element. So um, contrast can be, uh, you know, regular and irregular line, like, uh, uh, or geometric and organic shape, like we saw in the, the painting earlier. Or it can be something as simple as black and white, right? In the very famous images by Obey, which uh, are uh, of the Obey stickers, I should say, by the artist uh, Shepard Fairey, um, who, who created these um, as, a, as a way of sort of commenting on society and, and uh, our, the way we can all sort of interpret images in, in different ways, but also in the way that we often uh, um, conform by buying brands. Um, he created this image using the famous uh, 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 wrestler Andre the Giant, uh, who you might know from uh, the movie uh, The Princess Bride, uh, and his very famous sticker, Obey Stickers. Uh, and he uses this contrast of black and white to create this very iconic, memorable image. Um, this, he did the same thing in his very famous um, po campaign posters for uh, Barack Obama, and his hope posters contrasting not only dark and light but also red and blue to create these very iconic images and you know I, I don't get into politics in this class I'm not posting this to uh, sort of argue one way or the other uh, <laughs> uh, about political positions but as an image this was a very famous and very often imitated image and I think one reason why this image stuck with people was because it was so iconic and so memorable because of the high contrast. Um, so th these images, uh, the Obey sticker especially, uses something um, uh, positive and negative shapes. A positive shape is defined by its surroundings, um, and by the empty space around it. So sort of the, the black here would be the positive shape, and then the negative space would be sort of the emptiness here, the white. Um, around, so positive and negative. Uh, example here too, positive and negative shapes. The gun is the positive shape. This is the negative space around it. And even in a color image, 
we can see the use of positive and negative uh, shapes. These often create a very high contrast, very iconic kind of image. Um, another way to think of positive and negative space is something called figure ground reversal. This is the reversal of the relationship between one shape and its background so that the figure becomes the background and the background becomes the figure. This can be seen in this woodcut here by the artist uh, M.C. Escher. No, he was not a rapper. Uh, his initials were M.C. Um, but, uh, you know, you can see how the figure in the foreground, the duck or the goose here, whatever it is, duck, duck, goose, um, slowly flips with the background and the background becomes the front figure, in this case a fish, and the goose becomes the background, or the duck, whatever it is, the fowl, uh, becomes the background. That is a figure ground reversal. It's a cool little trick. Um, the artist uh, did this by basically breaking the image down into small uh, shapes that fit together. This is called tessellation. Tessellation is an arrangement of shapes closely fitted together, especially of polygons, that's just a fancy word for multi sided objects in a repeated pattern without gaps or overlapping. And, and the artist M.C. Escher got this from studying Islamic art, actually, uh, which uh, these kinds of common, these patterns are very common. And, and if you look at it, if you look at it one way, you see these sort of shark fin shapes. But if you look at it another way, you see hexagons and stars. It's sort of cool, right? So there's a lot of figure ground reversal going on and these, this tessellated image. And there's going to be a video down below about MC Escher that I want you to watch. Okay, so that's it for chapter 1.1. I will see you guys in the next chapters. Bye.